Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy, and I am an alcoholic. (laughs) My home group is the Carry This Message group of West Orange, New Jersey, and my sobriety date is January 1st of 1991. Um, Okay, the first thing I want to ask is how many of you are putting Mother Nature in your first column? Everybody who had expectations that spring had sprung just got... (laughs) Um, I like the cold, so I guess it it came back for me. Um, I'd like to talk a little, yeah, just for me, of course, I'm the center of my universe. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, start off with, um, more about alcoholism, the chapter, um, chapter three. And in this chapter is where we kind of start the talking, or we start seeing about the, um, mental obsession with the alcohol. How that, uh, even when I'm not drinking, I am consumed with the idea of alcoholism, uh, or with alcohol, I should say. Uh, one of the first lines I loved in right at the beginning, it talks about the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. I have never in my entire life controlled and enjoyed my drinking. I have controlled it at times. I have enjoyed it many times but I have never done both enjoy and control. Um, That alone tells me that I belong here. Um, It's The majority of what I'm I'm talking about tonight is going to be into step two and and the spiritual malady and and the fact that we are insane. But this is a great place to... I'm insane. Let me rephrase that. But um, this is a great place to start. It's like a great jumping off spot because we need to see where our own insanity comes from. And we need to see that we are obsessed. I need to see that I am obsessed with, with alcohol. Um, I have at this point in time in my drinking career lost the ability to control and decide whether I'm going to drink or not. I, I don't have. When I got to this place, I didn't have any choice. The whole thing of just say no or just not drink today or choose not to drink today is an impossibility for me. Um, I can't choose that anymore. Alcoholism has taken that away from me. I've gotten to the point beyond where I can, I can, if I could do that, I don't have to be here. So, um, that's, that's really part of that whole obsession that I, I should be able to, and my obsession that I should be able to control it is what gets, I become like the hamster on the wheel. I, I think I can control it. I think I can control it. I go out. I try to con- control it. I can't control it. I'm drunk. I wake up the next day. I'm miserable. I'm never going to drink again. Ah, oh, well, one won't hurt. I can control it this time. I can control it this time. I can't control it this time. I'm drunk. And on and on and on. Um, there are a lot of, more about alcoholism has some great, great, great stories in it, um, that just really point up that whole hamster on the wheel deal. Um, there is some, um, there are some spots in here where they, some places where they tell you, uh, how to, you know, how to, uh, hit the, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a different book than I had originally. Okay. There are, they talk, talk about uh, hitting the bottom. And uh, on page 34, it says, um, near, the, near in, in the first paragraph, though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry for anything like a year. And they're suggesting that we, you know, if you're not sure, if you're an alcoholic, don't drink for a year. Even if you can stay dry, try not to, I'm going to add to it, don't drink and try not to think about the alcohol for a year. 
You know, that's um, even if I can do it, because I, I in my history, I had a um, I had lots of periods of time where I didn't drink. Um, I could go to the wedding and have two drinks. That wasn't a problem. As long as I knew there was a bottle at home, you know, and then I needed, you know, so as long as I knew that I wouldn't, I, I didn't have to drink a lot at the, uh, at the wedding in public and make a, a slob out of myself. As long as I knew that when I got home, I had it. Uh, if I didn't, if there wasn't anything at home, all bets were off. I was going to make sure that I had plenty of alcohol in me one way or another. So, um, you know, just the fact that I could, Control it at times reinforced the idea that I, ha I still had some control. Um, some of the, the stories in here with um, some of the stories in here are really terrific. Uh, the first one they talk about is Jim, and with Jim, Jim has a, what we call a suddenly. Um, he's you know, some things are going again, and he's out in the country. He's looking for a prospect to buy some cars. He's hungry. He stops at a roadside diner um, or a cafe, and um, he's sitting there, and everything's pretty okay, and he decides that suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my mouth, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. Um, I've gratefully never um, had a, as yet, a suddenly where I actually um, gave in to the temptation. I mean, I, I came in and I haven't, I haven't had the need to go back out again um, as yet. I hope I never do. But I've had the suddenly thoughts, you know, it's sort of like, well, nobody's looking, you know, um, who's going to know if I've just had a little bit? Um, the thoughts come. So, I mean, I think, and I can't tell you when they're going to come. I can't tell you when that, that suddenly hits. Um, if I could, I could plan for it and I could protect myself, you know, but I can't. So that's why they call it suddenly. Um, so I need to make sure that I'm in fit spiritual condition. You know, and this comes, um, this comes when, as I work, as I work through the program, I don't expect anybody in step one to be in fit spiritual condition as yet. Um, I wasn't, that's for sure. Um, one of the other stories, <clears throat> the other story that particularly, I guess I, I like is, um, the Jay Walker. I, there's just no way without, if I take the Jay Walking out of there and, and put alcohol in there, it, it, Describes me to a T. I mean, I never, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to get me this time. It just isn't going to get me this time. So I keep going out and doing the same thing. Um, the the Jay Walker starts at the bottom of page 37, and just to read a little bit of it, it says, "Our behavior is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink." as that of the individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. I used to get a thrill out of just having a couple of drinks, you know, going to uh, going to the restaurant and, and feeling like a grown-up and having getting to have a, a cocktail. Um, he enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. You know, it's like, you're not, you know, you're not old enough or you're not supposed to be having the drinks. Uh, up to this point, you would label him this foolish chap, queer idea, fun. Then luck deserts him, and he is slightly injured several times in succession. Had a few of those blackouts. Didn't remember what I did. Oops. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. I um, Actually, there was a friend of mine I was talking to today, and... We were having, we weren't having discussion about alcoholism, but alcohol in general. There was an accident by our job and they were talking about it and they got into this whole thing of, oh, it was probably alcohol and this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, he talked about having had a pretty bad accident about 20 years ago, drinking and driving. And he described the accident and, and he said, you know what? I made a promise to my wife that I was never going to do that again. And I haven't. I'm dying. 
what's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, he's take my word for it, he's still a heavy drinker, but he won't drink and drive. I would have loved to be able to make, you know, be able to say at some point, I'm not going to do that ever again, you know, and I couldn't. So it's as, you know, as I said, you would expect him um, to cut it out, and he didn't. He couldn't, as I couldn't. Presently, he's hit again, and this time he has a fractured skull. Oh, well, let me see what happened to me. I, I had an automobile accident while I was drinking and ended up with a concussion and ended up in the hospital a couple times. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. I didn't have any more accidents, thankfully, but I had a lot more blackouts. Um, he says he ten- that he's decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks he breaks both legs. I end up somewhere in uh, another state that I, and I vaguely know the person I'm with. Okay. On through the years, his, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. I, I won't drink as much this time. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce. He's el- held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get jaywalking idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. Um, I cut myself off from people for about three years and lived a life of a sort of life of a hermit. And I just refused to have any friends. And I moved to a new area and made no friends and cut off all my old friends, figuring that'll help. It was the people that were getting to me. Um, But the day he comes out of... He races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? And, but that, you know what? You take out jaywalking and you put in alcohol, and I think that, you know, absolutely, I, I can't tell you how much I identify with, with the jaywalker on that one. Um. <laughs> Okay, we have, um, they, they talk further in this chapter about, um, knowledge. That the, uh, the next guy talks about having plenty of knowledge about himself and having knowledge about his alcoholism and, and understanding just exactly what it is that he does and why he shouldn't do it. And, uh, the guy goes out and drinks again. You know, self-knowledge isn't the answer. We can't do that alone. Just with our own, um, it's sort of like my own brain trying to tell me how to to fix something. My brain that doesn't work too well when I'm in the midst of my alcoholism is trying to tell me how to make it work better, and and I can't do it. So self-knowledge alone can't help it. Um, there's you know there's there's Fred in here. I. I'm not going to go into all of them with uh, all the stories, but Fred's in there too. So it just, you know, it, it just points up at this point that we have um, a disease that affects us physically, as um, some people before me were talking about, mentally. We we're looking at here in, in, in we agnostics how it affects, you know, our thinking and spiritually. Um, I have, um, we agnostic starts the story of, of the spiritual malady. I, um, my history with, with we agnostic, or my history with, um, a belief in a higher power, a power greater than myself, um, is one that I came in to the rooms believing in a higher power. I had no problem with that. Um, I went through 13 years of a Catholic school. The nuns told me they were there. They were my higher power for many of those years. But, um, you know, I, I truly did believe, you know, in, in a God, in a, you know, higher power, whatever you want to call it. My problem was, though, I'm as, it's as difficult for me to accept what the book was telling me as it is, I think, sometimes for the person who doesn't believe in a God at all. Because even though I had a, a higher power, I had one that was way out there. He wasn't one that I, that was personal to me. It wasn't one that I could touch. It wasn't something that I could call on in, in, you know, in words I could call on, but I didn't believe that I got heard. 
You know, the, the higher power that I believed in was very, very big, huge. And I was very, very small, infinitesimal, much too small for my higher power to ever see me and ever work in my life. Um, you know, he was, he was the, the God of my understanding at that point when I came in was the one you went to church for. He was there on Sundays. Uh, yeah, the nuns taught me that he was all present. Uh, and he was everywhere, but you got to visit him on Sundays. It's sort of like you go to your mom's house and, you know, you go to your grandmother's house or something on Sundays and visit. Very similar. Um, I needed to get in touch with a God of the end of my under, own understanding, one that allowed me to, um, to connect with him on a regular basis. Um, One of the reasons I needed the God of my own understanding in that case is because the step two talks about came to believe in a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. I think the first thing that I needed was to make sure that I understood that I was insane. Um, and my insanity, my insanity wasn't, wasn't what I did when I drank. Anybody, even my mom, who doesn't drink, would act as crazy as that as I did when, if we put alcohol in her. As a matter of fact, I think I did as a child see her drunk once, and yeah, she did some crazy things. Um, but she's not an alcoholic. You know, you put alcohol in anybody, and they're going to do some <coughs> different things. You know, some of them may be outrageous, some of them may be just be funny, some of them may be sad. But most of us, if we put alcohol in anyone, we act differently because it takes away our inhibitions. But for me, the um, the idea that I could control it, my ego in charge, that I could control my drinking, that this time it's not going to hurt me, um, was the thing that, that I had to get in touch with as my insanity. That's what I had to see for me, that... Um, I needed to depend that of my own, I, I, of myself, I am nothing. You know, I can't do it. Um, I needed something greater than I than I was. Um, I came in with a higher power, and I learned to make that higher power. I don't know how to put it exactly, but fit around me. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't out there. It became something that surrounded me, and it fit me. Um, I um, I don't think it matters much how you manage to get there. You know, we all get there through different routes. Um, I I used to have a, a a real hard time with with people that said, "Well, make the doorknob your higher power." Or anything. I have a little trouble with that one actually because it doesn't do anything. Um, it doesn't do anything unless I make it do something. You know, if I turn it, it'll open the door. That's fine. But then I'm still the power in that. But I can, I can get with making AA a higher power because you as a group of people are doing together what I can't do by myself. Um, and that works for a while. Or that did work for me for a while because I came in here and I stayed sober on fellowship. I stayed sober with meetings. Um, it was something I needed to learn, and it was something I needed to do, but eventually it wore a little thin because as much as you are a group of people who are doing something together that I can't do alone, uh, you're all still human, and every once in a while you do fail me. Every once in a while you're not going to be at the other end of the telephone when I need you. Every once in a while, you're not going to have the answers I need when I when I run to you. And until I can find that place inside of me that I know that um, that that's where the answers are, I'm going to be in a place where I'm going to get hung out to dry. I'm going to have a suddenly at some point. I think there comes a time in all of our lives, in some time, some place, that we're going to end up with a thought and 
if we don't can't find the God of our own understanding inside of us, there is not going to be anybody else around you. I mean, it, you know, you're going to get caught somewhere. You're going to be, you know, with, your cell phone's dead, your car just died uh, in front of a liquor store. Um, <laughs> it's raining. You have a flat tire. I, you know, whatever, whatever it is that it, you know, that happens to you. Some, there's going to be a place in time in our lives at some place that we're going to get, and and if you know, I mean, we can make it if we're not if we don't if we're not connected with our higher power. I think I think we can contrive it sometimes, almost unconsciously, you know, that things happen. And so I need a good excuse. Um, if I if I start the practices, if I do the things um, and, and get connected to the, to the power that I believe will keep me sober, and if I, you know, if I believe that there's a power that will keep me sober, um, it will. Um, I can't say that I don't need people. I always need people because most of the time, not, God very seldom comes down and knocks on my door and says, "Hi, Kath." Here, I'd like you to do this today. You know, um, I get my my answers. I get my connection to my higher power often through the people in the rooms, through other people that I meet if I stay open. But I also know that if nobody else is around, if nobody is in, you know, the world suddenly goes silent, um, I, I still have a connection. I still have a connection, and that's inside of me. And it's there whenever I want it, whenever I want to tap into it. In the book, it talks about, it makes an analogy to the electricity, and I've always loved that. I don't necessarily have to understand electricity. I don't have to be an electrical engineer. I don't have to, you know, know how it works. All I have to know is that if I go over to that switch and flick it, I get light. Or, you know, if I go down to my furnace and turn on the switch, I'll get heat. Um, that's that's what what God is for me. I don't need. I can't, and I don't understand Him. I can't understand Him. Um, and when I try to understand Him, I limit. I put limits on that on that God. Um, but I also know that any time that I go, any time that I need uh, the power, it's always available to me. All I have to do is flick the switch. You know, or open my heart, or listen to to what you have to tell me. Um, it's always, you know, it's it's always available. I wrote some things down here, most of which I'm not flicking past. I thought this was going to take the whole time. I'm going, oh, my goodness, I've got so many things. But one of the things that I wrote down here was um, that I had to come to believe that God was deep within me. And that I had, this is the other piece that I, I think I didn't understand, that I had as, as, as much a right to access that power um, as anybody else. You know, I didn't have to be, I didn't have to be perfect to go to God. You know, he doesn't... Uh, he, he doesn't need saints. He doesn't need perfect people. He, 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 he's there for those of us who aren't perfect. Um, and I needed to know that I had a right to go there, you know, it, that he was available to me. I, um, in, in my, my ego gets in the way and my ego doesn't always make me huge. You know, my ego is not one that usually has me strutting around going, aren't I great? Usually my ego takes me in the other direction. And it goes, aren't, aren't, aren't you small? Aren't you insignificant? Aren't you worthless? Um, I always talked about alcoholism being, for me, it's a disease of est. I have to be the est of something. I have to be the superlative of something. I want to be the best, but I don't believe it. So I'll be the worst or the smallest. And... That's as much my ego. That's as much being not humble as strutting around going, aren't I great? Look at me. I'm queen of the world. You know, because it, that still takes me and, and makes me different, makes me unique. 
or at least I think, you know, it, it, it's my thinking that's trying to make me unique and separate me from everybody else. Um, I needed a lot of, um, I needed a lot of humility. And for me, the definition of humility is to be my right size. Not that I'm, you know, huge or, 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 you know, terrific or not that I'm also the smallest. And in that I needed, you know, that's where I got the, the, uh, as I lost some of that um, uniqueness, as I lost some of that, um, as I let go of some of that th- thinking that I was um, so small and so insignificant, um, that's, you know, when my humility started coming. Excuse me. One of the things <clears throat> they talk about in the book and that Ebby had said that made such an impact on Bill was the idea that um, it's your own conception of God. Um, one of the things that I do with people that I sponsor is um, I ask them to write it out. What is it? Given no boundaries, none whatsoever. Um, what would you like your God to be? And, you know, they usually do the writing, and it's, you know, all these wonderful things. And I said, okay, it is. You know, when they bring it back to me, it just is then. Um, it doesn't have to be my concept, and I don't have to agree with it. Um, it just has to be something that each person can live with as their own concept. My concept is very traditional. Uh, my concept of my higher power, as I said, I was raised 13 years of a Catholic school. It's really hard to erase some of that stuff. Um, not that I particularly want to, but the um, but the concept of God I have is is very much, you know, all knowing, all powerful, all uh, all present. You know, the Baltimore cat. For those of you who might be Catholic, the Baltimore Catechism. Um, nope, we got a few that know it. <laughs> um, God. Um, Pretty much, but brought down to a place where I have, I, I can connect with him, you know. But if that doesn't work for you, that's fine, you know. It's however it is. But the one thing that I will suggest to you, um, is don't put the boundaries on, on, on the God as you understand him. Keep, keep the door open for, for that concept to constantly grow, change, and, and become different. Um, as I said, the God of my understanding at this point, I, I, I basically, my concept is that there's no concept because my God has gotten so big, so large, um, that it's not containable in my head. And this is good. You know, this is good. Um, he's, he's grown beyond me. Which is marvelous because I have to definitely get out of out of me. <laughs> um, in the uh, on the bottom of 46, it talk, he, it, Bill gives a bunch of um, names to him, and he says, as soon as we have admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we begin to possess, to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took simple steps, one through twelve. Uh, we found that God does not make too hard terms to those who seek him. To us, the realm of the spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who honest, to earnestly seek him. We believe it is open to all men. He's telling us right there that there aren't any boundaries. It's all-inclusive. Everything and anything you can possibly think of, God is. And anything and everything you can't think of, God is. Um... And so, you know, it says, don't let prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you. Um, I hear a lot of people in the rooms talk about, particularly, I guess, I don't know, I, I'm, I hear people in the rooms talk about the Catholic religion a lot of times, and, and they're recovering Catholics and, and, and that type of thing. And um, I think that there, there are people, I've, I know I've talked to people who have, um, 
come into the rooms, some friends of mine who were raised as a Catholic, one woman I know that raised as a Catholic and like just completely didn't want to hear about God, was so turned off from it, didn't want to hear about it, and um, took a long time to, to find something that she could live with um, because of prejudice, because of things that, that, you know, have they've been taught or they've seen and, and haven't liked. Religions are made up, to me, religions are made up of people. Um, the spirituality is, is God. It, it, it's, it has nothing to do with people. You know, people, when you, when you put people into any mix, I think we mess it up because we're not perfect. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It just is, it just is. I mean, you know, humans are not, not perfect. The, the first day I wake up perfect, I will be dead. Um, so we do things every once in a while that, you know, people, well, if you were practicing what you preach, you know, you wouldn't do such and such. Um, yeah, in an ideal world, that's true. But when I can move away from what people do and still see just what God does, um, there's no way I can go back to where I was before. There's no way that I can't believe in him. There are so many miracles in my life, and I don't mean just, you know, I've been healed of such and such, but just small things, um, awakenings. Um, and all of that comes for me when I, when I open my heart to what can be. And I allow, you know, I allow the God, as I understand him, to come in and, and lead me. And he shows me where he wants me to be. And and by the way, my God still is a he. I told you he's very traditional, so I use he. Um, it's fine. You know, we've got, got a lot of goddesses in there. Can be a higher power too. Um, but um, you know, there's just been too many miracles in my life to call them coincidences. Actually, Mike Mike calls them godcidences. I think that was pretty good when, you know, it's like coincidences that are really the hand of God that are in there. Um, he's always there. He's always doing them. And it's the, the difference is whether I'm connected or not, I'm awake or not. Uh, he has always been in there. He's always been in the mix. Even when I was drinking, he's always been in the mix. You know, he's always been present in my life. He's always been there. But I wasn't. I was blocked off. I have to get to a place with my, I had to get to a place with my alcoholism that I realized that I can't do anything about it and there's no other human power that's going to do anything about it. My mom, my dad couldn't help me, my brother couldn't help me, um, you know, all my friends couldn't help me, uh, my job couldn't help me. And I had to get to a place, and my bottom wasn't that, well, I don't know, depending on how you look at it. I didn't think that my bottom was that horrendous in the sense of I hadn't lost my job, I hadn't lost my house, I hadn't lost my family, I hadn't lost my car or my license. Um, I was still functioning and working for the moment. Um, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that, you know, I, it, had I not stopped there, that it couldn't get lower. But for me, it was low enough to be able to say, okay, Okay, I need something, I need something other than me. I need, I need the God in my life. So whatever that bottom is, and I think that's what, that's what we mean when we're saying a bottom. When we finally get to a place where we can't do it alone anymore, where we have to turn around and say, whatever else is out there, whatever it is, it's got to be better than what I'm doing. And, um, and that was, you know, for me, is. I don't know, I just, I had just given up. That My bottom was one that I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to live anymore. And that's actually how I came in. Um, I was blocked off enough from God that I didn't think there was an answer. I thought that um, the only answer for me was to leave. Just to check out and leave. And that's what I tried to do. Um... And when I woke up, I was very angry at myself because I didn't succeed. <laughs> I was human and I, I, you know, I messed it up. And I, I was still, I was still here. 
And it was slowly, my spiritual experience, as they talk about in the back and in the, the appendix where they talk about the spiritual experience, they talk about the kind that Bill has, which is a bright light, you know, sudden awakening to everything. Or there's my kind, the kind that I just kind of plodded along and did what was right in front of me. I didn't have any, I didn't have any fight left in me when I came to in the hospital. And, um, I've described it in the past of being like, you know, the, the old westerns, the tumbleweed. Tell me where to go and I'll go. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Not because not because I wanted to, but because I didn't have any fight left. And um, gratefully, you know, I got, this tumbleweed got pushed in the right direction. And, uh, you know, slowly but surely, uh, I began to get feel better and to wake up. And I recovered physically. And then I began to be recovered mentally. And then as my brain woke up and I, I... heard what this book says and I and it took me about three years in the program to find people who were talking about recovery in the book um, I began to wake up spiritually and began to get connected with with that power inside of me that I call my higher power um, in the in the fellowship when I was waking up you know I, I, I recovered uh, physically and and mentally, I was getting a handle on it. I was getting a handle on, you know, even with don't drink and go to meetings. But, you know, what was happening is I was getting connected to people. And I think that's where my first higher power kind of started with, that connection to people. Um, because I'm an, I'm an isolator. I'm an isolator. I'm going to run, I'm going to run into my rabbit hole and then I'm going to pull the hole in behind me so you can't come, come after me. Um, and, I didn't see it as such at that point, but I see today that that really was the beginning of, of God working in my life um, actively as he kind of put me out there with with other people. Um, people who were telling me, don't drink and go to meetings, um, and, and that's what I did. Um, people who began to be friends of mine. People who said, let's go on speaking commitments. People who said, um, let's go to the movies. And as I got less and less frightened of, of being out there with people, um, I started to meet more and more. And, and then I, I started to meet people who were working in the book. And then I found out, you know what, this isn't a hit or miss thing. You know, there are actual steps to take. And I'm going, wow. You know, that was uh, that was a big awakening for me. That was a... Uh, because I was in an area where, where people did a lot of fellowship. They did a lot of fun stuff. Um, I, um, I'm always, I'm, o- I'm always, I always get a chuckle out of, um, out of the book when it talks about things like, um, when Bill was writing about flying and lunar flight and everything else, and you know, and he says, "Well, of course, you know, we're, someday we may see this." And, and I'm reading it now when it's already a given, and it's sort of like that was the vision that they had. Um, where I was when I started to, uh, where I was about three years in the program, when I started to meet people who um, who were talking about this and talking about a higher power and talking about an inventory and um, you know, fifth, fifth stepping and making amends and all of that stuff that I hadn't heard about in the first few years. I think where I was at that point was, um, as I said, you know, people, the group were pretty much my higher power. They were the ones who were leading me. But when I looked at where I was inside, there's a great description of it on page 52. And they talk about the bedevilments, but it's, it really is where I was sober. Um, on 52, it said, um, second paragraph, it says, we had to ask, ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. 
That's where I was. That's where, where a lot of I was in the beginning, you know, not just in the beginning, definitely when I was, when I was drinking. I mean, forget that. That's, that was all, all of it. But even in sobriety, there was a lot of that in me at that place because I had put limits on my higher power. You know, uh, he was still the God in church and he was still the God up there on the altar. Um, I, I wasn't seeing the connection between that God that I learned about and the people in the rooms. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, I was still, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of unhappiness. I wasn't being particularly useful. Um, I was doing a lot of stuff. To, but doing a lot of things doesn't necessarily translate into being particularly useful. One day a woman got a hold of me and said, um, Who's your sponsor? And I went kind of well, uh, well, you know, it's sort of here. And then, well, I talked to her a bit, but she's moved away. And and she said, "I'm your sponsor." I said, "Oh, okay." And then she turned around and handed me some tapes to listen to. And it's the first time that I heard anything about like going through the steps. Up to that point, I thought that reading them off of the the, the wall, or reading them out of the 12 and 12, I went to a step meeting, so I was doing the steps. And I didn't realize that there was more work to do. Um, when I did, of course, I wanted to run in the other direction because I'm full of fear. I'm not being very useful, and, and you know, um, I'm going, I, I don't, and, and in inventory, I don't want to look at that. At that point, I was not capable of doing that because I didn't have... I didn't have a God that I could le- could depend on. Until I have that God I can depend on, there is no way that I am going to be able to go through the rest of the steps. I can't I can't look at myself, do a moral inventory of myself, tell somebody else about it, if I am living in that fear. I have to get in touch with something to know that I am safe and protected at all times, in any circumstances, no matter what. Um, and I don't know that anybody can give me that. You know, they can lead me, they can show me, they can tell me how they did, you know, what they did. But my God is mine, and your God is yours, and all I can do is, is show you that this is where you can, you know, you can be here. You know, it, it's, there's, there's no impossibilities. It's, it's very, <sighs> It's possible. I guess that's the best thing I can tell you is that it really is possible that there is a God of your understanding that you can lean on um, that will carry you through any circumstances. Um, mine's carried me through a number of them, some good and some bad. And um, gratefully, I have not felt the need to take another higher power because my original higher power was alcohol. Um, and today my, my, my higher power is, uh, for the most part, it's the God of my understanding, and once in a while it's my dog Gizmo. But uh, <laughs> he's pushy. Um, he has some trouble understanding. He's a dyslexic, so when we say D-O-G, he has problems, and he hears G-O-D. Um, no, I just being funny, but no, God, you know, the God of my understanding has gotten me through, um, all sorts of things. I, um, and the only problem I ever have today is when I'm not connected to him. Um, I have, um, a situation at work where sometimes it's really difficult in some of the people I work with. And there are times when my character defects have just been blatantly out there. And every time they've been there, it's because I'm not connected. I, I've, I've lost that connection, or I'm not depending on that higher power. I don't believe that he can get me through it. And that's when I'm, I'm really out there. When I take the time to connect um, and, and believe that he's going to carry me through anything, it's amazing how peaceful my day can be. I actually had a peaceful day at work today, and uh, my, my two worst people were there, um, the two most difficult people, let me rephrase that, it is not the worst, but the ones that I have the most difficulty, oh hush, 
the most difficulty. I've got somebody giggling over there. Uh, dealing with both of them. When both of them are there, it's usually a, a difficult day for me. And today wasn't. Because you know what? I took, I took about five minutes this morning, among other times, but I took about five minutes this morning to connect with that higher power and to remind myself that he's going to protect me in all things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, to remind myself a few times through the day, but it works. You know, so, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, think I'm gonna stop there because, um, I don't know what else to say. I didn't do much in the book. I just kind of really was talking more about the higher power as I see him. And, um, I want to thank you for having me here. And I wish you all well. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.